السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله احمده واستعينه واستديه واستغفره واؤمن به جل وعلا ولا اكفره واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين Kulihi wallahu karihal mushrikun. All praise belongs to Allah. We praise him, we seek his help, his assistance and his guidance. We believe in him and do not disbelieve in him. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant and messenger. Allah sent him that is Muhammad with Deen al-Haq, the religion, the way, the methodology of truth, and this way of life known as Islam will rise to its proper position in this world, whether the mushriks like it or not. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah yahmaru bil-adli wal-ihsani wa itai dil-kurba wa yanha nil-fashai wal-munkari wal-bagi Allah commands justice and the doing of good and liberality to kith and kin. And he forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion. He instructs you that you may receive admonition. فَمَنْ يَعْرِيَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَدِيَهُ يَشْرَ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Those whom in Allah's plan will it to guide, He opens their breasts to Islam. When Allah wants a blessing for us, well, Allah wants blessings for us all the time, but sometimes we build up uh, a situation where uh, it's not justified for Allah to to bless us. We put up our own barrier. Now that's pretty serious. When you put up a barrier between you and Allah, and Allah is, is al-Ghafurul Rahim. He's all forgiving, most merciful. That's what he calls himself in Quran. <laughs> if you... Uh, have managed to adjust your life where you're beyond the Ghafur, Al Ghafur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond his 
dispensation to help you at that time because now remember Allah can help you Allah can do anything Allah wants to but I have Allah has guidelines but he says for for myself I have set the rule of mercy this is what Allah says in Quran that I have set for myself the rule of mercy and the Quran calls or Allah calls himself al Ghafur Rahim. You know, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Rahma, Arham, the womb of the woman, because it's such a blessed place that in the womb everything is provided for you. And when you come out, you come out a full being, ready to go, ready to deal with uh, all the blessings you got coming, you're ready to receive them. Those whom an Allah in his plan will it to guide, he opens their breast to Islam. The Sadda, the Sadur, he opens Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, Allah prepares us for blessings. Yeah. Just like he prepares us a mother to give birth to us. Ya ayyuha ladina manu haka Tukatihi wala tamutuna ila wa antum muslimun. Oh, you believe, fear Allah as he should be feared and do not die except in the state of Islam. Wa tasimu bihablillahi jami an wala tafarraku. Wa kuru niamatallahi alaykum. And hold fast all together by the rope which Allah stretches out for you and be not divided amongst yourselves. And remember with gratitude Allah's favor on you. Kuntum khaira umatin ukrijat lil nasi tamaruna bil marufi wa tanhauna nil munkar wa tukhminuna billah. You are the best people's Raised up for mankind and joining what is right and forbidding what is wrong and believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amma ba'd fa'inna astikal hadith kitabullah wa utaka al ura kalimatu taqwa wa khayrul milali milatu ibrahim wa khayrul sunani sunatu muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ashraful hadith dhikrullah wa asadu al kasasi had al Quran wa khayrul umuri awazimuha wa shayrul umuri muhtatatuha wa asadu al hadju hadju al anbiya wa ashraful maut katlu shuhada wa amma al amma dalalatul bad al huda. وخير الأعمال ما نفاء وخير الهادي ما أتباء وشير الأمة أم الكرب. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the most truthful of discourses is كتاب الله or the book of Allah. The most trustworthy word is taqwa or fear of Allah. The best of the community is the community of Prophet Ibrahim. The best way of life is the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The remembrance of Allah is the most glorious of all things. The best of all narrations is Quran. The best acts are those requiring the highest degree of will and determination. The worst acts are those based on innovation. The best way of life is the one adopted by the prophets of Allah the most glorious death is the death of a martyr. The most wretched blindness consists of going astray after finding the right way. Best acts are the ones that yield benefits. Best guidance is that which people may be able to follow. The worst blindness is the blindness of the heart. Okula kaulehada wa astafrullah li walakum.
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa takun minkum umatun yad'una ila al-khayr. Wa yahmaru bil marufi wa yanhawna nil munkar wa tuhminun billah. Wa ulaika humul muflihun. Let there arise out of you a band of people inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right, forbidding what is wrong. They are the ones to attain felicity. And this word uh, in the Quran. Felicity is mentioned as muflihun, from the word falah. You know, we say hayal al-salah, hayal al-falah. Come to prayer, come to success or salvation. So this word falah means success, come to success. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in this ayat, let there arise out of you a band of people, yahmaru bil maruf wa yanhawna nil munkar, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. They are the ones to attain felicity. They're going to be the ones to... Mm, be successful. Let's, okay, now, <laughs> success sometimes has its, success always has a certain price. Uh, discipline, self-control, focus, visionariness, you know, the ability to see ahead, the ability to continue to work in a continuous way over long periods of time, the ability to Avoid those things that are harmful and move toward those things that are, that are good for you, right? All of that takes discipline, self-control, and it takes sabr also, patience, you know. And uh, there's some hadith that, uh, one hadith that talks about uh, asabru wa nifsu liman. Now, most people know the hadith about getting married is protection, uh, perfection of half of your faith, right? But in this hadith, nifsuli man, asabru wa nifsuli man means that patience is half of faith. And that patience means that when it, it comes in all forms, but the word sabr means to check, to tie, and to contain. It means to hold on at all costs. It means if everybody else lose their composure, it don't make no difference to you because you are part of the asabirin. You are sticking. You're not following the crowd. If they go in the right way, we with you. Alhamdulillah, that's great. But if you're going to buckle and break down in front of challenge or facing obstacles, then you have to go by yourself. Or don't worry, you won't be by yourself. Everybody going to be with you. And you going to be by yourself. You got to get that straight. <laughs> the Siberian, those people that have, that's why we say 95% of ability is stick ability. The ability to stick, the ability to hold, uh, to be able to check, to tie, that's what sabr means, and contain whatever it is, your, your emotions, your hopes, dreams, and aspirations. You're going to have to be, <laughs> it sounds like a nice, easy word, but it's a tough call. It is the toughest call, one of the toughest in Quran. So this is why it says, let there arise out of you a band of people inviting 
to all that is good. Inviting everybody to good. That's basically what we try to do here. We've been trying to do it. وَيَحْمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَا نِلْمُنْكَرِ Joining what is right and psychologically, emotionally forbidding what is wrong. We tell you, that's, that's not good over there. Boss man got a bad record. Uh, okay, we say it 20, 30, 40. <laughs> well, how far do you go back? You're going to find that's our language. Trying to point out, well, you're going to listen to boss man? You yeah, make a... Both man got all the job. Boss man, if he man, boss man, he got he got it going on. Well, so did boss man in history. But there comes a time in history. <laughs> boss man is not outside of the historical process. Remember that. And plus, that historical process, remember what I basic guidelines are. Uh, number one, Quran. Number two, the Sunnah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's a, those are our guidelines. Right? And then it says travel in the earth and see what was the end of those before you. Right? History. And then we have our fourth one. Our experience here in America. And under those guidelines, we have, we've had a pretty reasonable record here. Okay, you can see how many people are here, so you can see how people feel about uh, that direction. But in every case, we have tried to mention those things that we know are basically correct. That's all we can do. See, when you read the Quran, now you have an obligation. When you study the Sunnah, now those are uh, uh, an obligation on you. You are now responsible to try to understand and implement as much of the Quran and Hadith as possible. Not beyond your ability. Like we can't go up and down the street and make everybody do nothing. Right? We can't do that. We don't have that ability. Uh, we're doing not too bad by just telling everybody. Yahmaru bil marufi wa yanhauna nil munka. Enjoining what is right. And verbally we can forbid what is wrong. But we can't stop nobody from doing wrong. If, they de if they're determined... We can say, you know, <laughs> boy, that don't look too good there. I tell you, let me see what a ayat that is. That don't look too good. If they do it, it's beyond you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had that feeling of love and compassion too for his people. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told him, I, I am al Hasib, the accountant. It's not your responsibility to make them do nothing. That's my job. In other words, to call them to account. Right? Because he loved his people, he knew he had the truth, and he wanted, he wanted good for his people. But it's not his responsibility. Just like it's not your responsibility and it's not mine to make people do right. All right. So let there arise out of you a band of people inviting to all that is good and joining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Uh, they are the ones to attain felicity. They are the ones that do this. If we trying to help everybody, we enjoying it right as much as we can and we directing people away from the wrong. Those are the people, when you say, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala al-falah, they are the muflihun. They are the ones who will attain success, inshallah. Uh, just a few things that 
Uh, I think I would like to read a hadith. And this is a pretty long hadith. It's uh, dealing with, uh, with the Quran. So, and this hadith is related on the authority of Ali radiallahu anhu that the, he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Beware of a great trial, a great fitna that will appear. Ali radiallahu anhu asks, What is the way out of that, O Prophet of Allah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, the book, the book of Allah, Al-Kitab, Kitabullah. The book, the book of Allah, in it are instructive narratives of preceding nations and information about things to come. So the Quran informs of the future consequences and outcome of deeds that we do. So, <laughs> There's a great fitna coming, and it's a great fitna during every generation. This is during the time of Ali, radiallahu anh. And Allah is telling, or the Prophet is telling him, there's a great fitna going to come. And you know, for Imam Ali, it was a serious fitna. You know, he faced a serious fitna. So Allah is telling him, or the Prophet is telling him, what to do during that great period. So, what is the way out of that, O Prophet of Allah? And he replied, the book of Allah. Hold on to the book of Allah. In it is the narrative of information about things to come. And also about the history of nations. You know, we deal with a lot of history here. All the time dealing with history. Why? Because we're reading Quran every Ramadan, right? And a lot during the year. And maybe we're not paying a whole lot of attention to it. <laughs> and we read in the Hadith. You go to some Masajid and they have the Hadith right there. And they read them after every prayer. It seems like the ones that are reading the most Hadith are, I don't know, I don't have nothing to say. No, it's just unbelievable. You go around and you see if they had a hadith there, and they go through volume after volume on every subject, and they down with it. If you pinch them, they'll start running off hadith. But if you watch their behavior, you might miss a few points here. So now, it's a narrative about things to come and the consequences of deeds, that mean of amal and of akhlaq, moral conduct. That's why we say, what do we follow here? We follow the Quran. Now, that means we actually try to do it. Now, it's not, you got to train yourself to have fun following the Quran. Because it ain't, if it ain't no fun, if you just jump up and you're a good believer, you just say, hey, man, it says this. It says, hey, I'm going to do that. Well, like uh, the guy come to the prophet, he said, I love you, old Rasulullah. He said, watch out what you say. He said, oh, I love you, old Rasulullah. Watch out what you say. Oh, I love you, O Rasulullah. And then the guy said it a third time and he said, then be prepared for like prison and death and all of those things and poverty. Hey, yeah, you love me? Good, good, good. Watch what you're saying. So the Quran, the Quran is a narrative of things that has happened and how we associated last night in class, we was doing an association. Uh, the association was something in the past, but it had uh, pertinency right now. We talked about two greatest ships 
in the last century. They were both battleships. One was called the Yamamoto and one was called the Bismarck. And the Yamamoto was built under, I mean, they had it covered up where you had to have your ID card. This is a building in Japan. This is the biggest battleship in history. And it took them a couple of years or more to build the thing. And it was finished by 1939 or 40. And then the Bismarck was a German battleship. This was a bad, those was bad, hey man. They would start blasting on you before you could see them because they had high cunning towers, you know what I mean? And on the water, <laughs> and uh, the, the, the Bismarck sunk the hood. It was over 20 miles away when it sunk it. And the Yamamoto was a, a Japanese battleship. It was the pride of Japan, I'm telling you. And it was big, it was bad. The only thing was, they was built either in World War II or at the beginning of World War II. In the days of the dreadnought, the big battleships had passed. It was a World War I phenomena when they was the greatest thing on the ocean. But they kept them up into World War II. In fact, they still had in New Jersey, some of them uh, right now, battleships. The only thing about it is they had developed air power. And both of those ships were sunk to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> you know how? Little things like airplanes, biplanes, and torpedoes. So it costs the British $500 to sink a trillion dollar battleship, the Bismarck. And it took the Americans, that battleship, when it went to the bottom over in, in Okinawa, it was way at the end of World War II, but they sunk it with airplanes and a few torpedoes. Why? Because the days of the battleship was over. Right? And the Japanese knew it because they had aircraft carriers. Remember they, when they attacked Pearl Harbor, it was on aircraft carriers. So they knew that the aeroplane had in a, involved itself in history and evolution, right? And in warfare, where the aeroplane could now do away with, with aircraft carriers. We could you could take planes wherever you wanted to take them, as long as there's ocean there, right? And so World War II, the main things about World War II in the Pacific was not battleships, it was aircraft carriers. Midway, all those battles was won by aircraft carriers, being able to get planes to where you wanted them to go. Uh, this is evolution. The Japanese knew it, but the Americans came in at the end uh, of World War II. Remember, 1941, December, everybody else was fighting since 1939. They was fighting in Europe. They've been fighting. And everything that America built was new. It was new. So they came in, the the aircraft carriers, even the Japanese had, they started building them in the 30s because they was going to jump on boss man back then, right? But during the war, they didn't have time to continue with their military evolution. You see what I'm saying? So the U.S. come in at the end of World War II and they didn't have nothing so they scientists start popping up with everything brand new. Right? And by the end of World War II they had the atomic bomb 
They had the B-29. The B-29, at the end of, that thing had all kind of strategic located. That boy was bad. I guess y'all wouldn't remember what a B-29 was. It was an old bomber, the one with glass in the front. They called it a super fortress because it could, you know, usually a bomber can get knocked out, but these things had machine guns all over the place, and it, it was bad. And it could fly pretty high, too. Okay, that's the thing that dropped the atomic bomb. The point I'm getting at is, is that the Quran reminds us over and over and over again about everybody in history getting a chance, right, at rulership and leadership. And the British had their chance, the Romans had their chance, right? The Greeks had their chance. Africans had Egypt, all those. They had a chance to, to rule their part of the world. Okay, not that Allah would find out what they would do, but for them to find out about themselves. Okay, now back home to the United States. The United States right now, it would seem like it's undefeatable. It used to seem like that. And can't do nothing with it because it's so big, it's so well fortified. But the U.S. right now today is just like the Yamamoto and just like the Bismarck. You could sink them with small stuff. Where's the U.S. right now? Yesterday? You're talking about blunders. The reason you don't have to do nothing to boss man, because he's going to out-blunder you. You can't get in the way of, you couldn't produce Afghanistan. Where he'd been over there 20 years and haven't did nothing, then he'd run off and leave. And before he leave, he have all the weapons that the military industrial complex can produce and bring them over there a couple of weeks before they come back here. Mm, mm, mm. And he leave everything behind for the Taliban. Is it the first time? Absolutely not. The Taliban, when they was in the refugee camps in Pakistan over 20 years ago, who do you think raised them up? The United States government. ISI, the Pakistani military and secret service, raised them up, weaponized them, taught them, trained them, and got them ready to go. And they caused a lot of trouble then. But right now, all them helicopters, all those tanks, all those Humvees and they have, they're not going to do no good because it's a different time. Sam tried to run off and leave it all behind for them because that was their agreement. You leave us this stuff and we'll take care of everything for you, boss man. But he can't do it this time. Not this time. 20 years ago, he had it going on. You can't do it this time because it's time for boss man to go. And he's going. If you watch any news, any mistake that is possible for him to make, he's going to make it. Why? Because he's guaranteed not to be here. He, he, he just was going to sell, the, the, the French was going to sell uh, some stuff to Australia. Y'all probably heard it on the news today and yesterday. Uh, and the U.S. jumped in or the U.S. was going to sell them some stuff. The U.S. jumped in and say, well, uh, don't buy it from France. We'll, we'll deal with it for you. And da, 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 da. and the French is burning up today. The French that helped them in, in the Revolutionary War, you know, the French helped them in the Revolutionary War. And every war since then, the French and the Americans have been home folks, Right? Well, why would the United States government cut the throat 
is that air conditioning on or is that something else coming out of there? Is that air conditioning, is that cool air? Or kind of a little sweaty air? Not that I'm sweating or nothing, but that's all right. Anyway, one of the things that you want to do is always try to figure out or place yourself in a strategic location. As part of warfare, it's called strategic brilliance. Strategic brilliance is when your imagination and your location in the, the, the psychological period, the physical period, or whatever, it is, whatever period it is that you're in, strategic brilliance, that means that you have the brilliance to recognize and understand what period you're living in. And then with that strategic brilliance, you place yourself in a location. It's again, strategic location. You locate yourself within that arena where you have the most advantages, where you put the less in and you get the most out. That means you place yourself as a balancer, if you balance yourself and you have that pole way out there and you can lift up uh, 10 tons of stuff by yourself because you got the leverage. So you place yourself, that is, if you understand the strategic leverage that you have. And you have to be kind of a student of history and it has to be a gift to you. Because you have a vision of the future, you want to write your own future, right? Because on the day of judgment, what, what book you going to read from? The one that you wrote yourself, right? Your deeds, right? So if we understand that, we want to write our own book. We want to write our place in it. Now, here we are. As a people, right now, we're in a perfect location in history. We're in the perfect place. And where we are, like right now, right here, or us, we're in the exact place. Nobody wants to be there. Nobody, right, want to be where we are. Because it ain't no fun. They look at it and they look, what, happened to, what, what happens to us? They said, that ain't no fun. You can't make no progress. You can't do nothing. They take your property. They do this. They do that. They do that little stuff. It don't make no difference. Well, then go to Afghanistan and, and deal with what they deal with. Right? Go to Yemen and deal with cholera and pestilence. Right? Go to Iran and get bombed or by the Zionists sometimes. Go, yeah, go to Palestine where they then took your physical country from you and make you, make it illegal for you to fight for your own freedom. Go there. Technically, when you look at all of that, we got it good here. We got it good here because of strategic brilliance. I want to tell you a little bit about it because you don't, nobody is <laughs> You got to use strategic brilliance means that the Negro born and raised here use every God-given gift that he had, right? At the right time, in the right place. So it's strategic location. It's strategic brilliance because this people, this group, is associating the whole historical process through one medium, the medium of today. And they're not paying attention to nobody else. And pretty soon, you got boss man. You, you have, I have to tell you, I'm going to tell you till I leave here, that you can domesticate. I know we didn't talked about this before. And 
You may believe it. You may not. Boss man don't believe it now. That we have domesticated him. What's domestication? You domesticate a cow, right? You domesticate all those other things that you want to manipulate for your benefit, right? You domesticate a cow because you want to get the milk. And after it's time to go, you know, it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, all of that, right? So the first things that the human being domesticated were dogs, cows, stuff like that. Why he domesticate a dog? Because a dog, you ever run with a dog in the woods? He run all up ahead. He's smelling everything. And he, whatever he run across, he's barking at it. There it is, boss. Right? It ain't nothing today. But go back 200 years ago from then on back, <laughs> the dog was magic, Right? Because he's going to run, I don't know if y'all ran in the hills. When you got a dog running with you, he run out ahead of you. He running all over, smelling everything. And if there's any danger out there, he going to pick it up. And he going to start barking at it. And if he's a pointer, the Irish setters, whatever they are, that boy going to have his tail this way and he going to be almost pointing at it. That's why they call him an Irish setter and stuff like that. That boy going to be... There he is, boss. That's you. You're the boss. And that means that you have now an arena of safety from your environment. Man, you ought to see how a dog deal with a snake, right? Think if you was in the jungle. Man, I was living out there in Virginia, out there in the country, on a farm when I first got here for a while. And... Uh, Couple, we had a little dog out there. At least they did. They called him Ike from Eisenhower. You could tell these is old folks. We called the poor dog Ike from Eisenhower. Anyway, boy, look at here. A snake would slip around there, and I, I was surprised how the dog could snatch that snake, and he would shake him so much the snake would be disorientated. And a dog, I didn't know dogs was that deadly on snakes. So that means all dogs, they whatever going to harm you. Remember, the human being is looking for something to protect himself, to feed himself. So the cow is going to feed him with milk. Remember in the Bible and all them, it talks about the land of milk and honey. When we was kids, one of the best drinks you could get was milk and honey. That was before all these squeeze jobs. They got stuff they got now. Right? So that means that the human being can look out into the creation and domesticate the things that help him. Right? Learn how to manipulate and learn how to control the things that help him. Right? That's in the earlier years. In the struggle, we're just a handful of people. We got to domesticate boss man. What do we got going for us? Is it numbers? No. Is it physical strength? No, we ain't got a whole lot of that. Everybody's a tattletale, so you can't have no whole lot of people. Right? You ain't going to get four or five people. You're lucky. You're big time lucky. Even if you get three, you big time lucky. Any, any number you get, you consider that luck. So what do you have? You have to use your brains. You don't have to worry. If you're a deep thinker, you don't have to worry for the first go, two, three go rounds because boss man don't think he built nothing that can do only sing his song. So boss man didn't made the Negro. Remember, he didn't made a, a, a being. He didn't. And the Negro is on his side. Well, not physically on his side, but anything 
Anytime something happened, the Negro going to go look out for boss man, just like a trained dog. He's going to go on over and got to look out for boss man. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. He'll do it in every war, every time. In the Civil War, they were shooting the Negroes down like dogs. World War I, right? The French went over there, lost a whole generation. The Negro went over there. They had the Negro, the Americans had them digging graves. The French, French had lost a whole generation. So guess what they said? Uh, can we have those niggas? They said, yeah, take them. The most decorated troops in World War I, Quad de Guerre, all that stuff, was Negro troops from the United States, not Negro troops from Africa. Right? Why do you think, I don't care whether it's Josephine Baker, all the jazz musicians during the 40s and the 50s, where did they go? France, in the 30s. Why? The French loved the Negro. And the Negro over here said, man, let me get on out of here and go over there to the white folks over there. They didn't have no, uh, <laughs> they said, hey, because they had lost the whole generation fighting the Germans in 1918, and the Negro come in and helped them. The Harlem Hellfighters, they call them, right? In World War II, the Negro did the same thing. What are they, the aviators? You know, the ones we see on the movies all the time. It ain't but a few of them left. They wear them red jackets, right? What, what do they call them now? Y'all know, I mean, good God. Tuskegee Airmen, that's them, right? After they got up in there, they didn't lose no white folks no more. Could you imagine how happy those flyers was, hey, if we get them niggas, they'll look out for us. Right? And they did. They lost themselves, a lot of them, but they didn't lose no more white folks after a while, maybe one or two here and there, but they was on their case and they did their job and they said hip, hip, hooray. Right? Because they was trained to help boss man. They was trained to love boss man. Okay. Therefore, when boss man look at us, he look at us as something to train to do his job. And when they looked at us, and we're out there in Oakland and young and everything, and they see Oakland going to be the center of something, so they figure, we got to get control of this. So all of a sudden, I didn't turn from a little black nationalist type person coming out of Penn in 65, Malcolm just smarted, and that's the years of rebellion. And the boss man, by 66, I'm selling marijuana. And guess who encouraged me to sell it? My two best friends. Not only they encouraged me, what they did, they just borrowed a couple hundred dollars. And then they say, you were so nice, we want to pay you back. Because I didn't mess with drugs. I didn't smoke no weed. I was, a, you know, one of them people. Nation of Islamers, you know, black man is God and white man is devil, all that type of stuff. So here's what they did. They paid me back, but they paid me back in marijuana. They gave me two and a half times as much as, as I borrowed, and they made big old fat bags. You know, one matchbox of weed was $5.00. Three matchboxes of weed in a bag was $10. They gave me $500 worth of uh, marijuana back. I guess it was 50 back. Whatever it was. Ten, but they put four matchboxes in. And it's supposed to be three. They just stuffed them. Guess what? I kept that principle all the time. So everybody, I took over the 
the marijuana thing. Is the police the one that set it up? The police is the ones that turned my partners out. Well, they was already doing what they do. And that was to divert me from this little black nationalism, gang leader stuff. They're going to divert everybody. Say, old boss man be thinking way ahead. I didn't notice. I didn't notice till years later. In, a, in other words, longevity allowed me the time to think about how did I actually get involved in this stuff, right? Longevity, very important. So when he, boss man, looked at me, the first two go-rounds, no problem. I could trick boss man all I wanted. Up until today, up to last week, that is. Because he's a nigger. He's susceptible to my game. I have the whole country. I have 50 million tattletales. and nothing he can do. Nothing. So you have to play within that environment, right? Because, see, longevity is different. Longevity gives you the ability to know the environment and study the environment that you're in. <laughs> That's right. That's deep. Boss man never had that before. He knock niggas over when he get ready. Right? He just knock them over. Or if he can't knock them over, he get people, other people to knock them over or to self-destruct. Right? That's why uh, Mexican gangs fight Mexicans, La Familia, you know, and M&Ms, Mexican Mafia, they fight and they kill each other. The black gangs in L.A., in Chicago, what do they do? They kill each other. Why? Because that's what boss man taught them to do. They don't fight boss man. Right? Ours is different. We always watch with enough time, you start watching the patterns of behavior. That's what history do. What does it say? Quran, Sunnah, History. Right? Study those patterns, those historical patterns. And even they'll launch attacks on you to make you fight niggas. We don't fight niggas. I'm sorry. Niggas get a free ride and they know it. Next time they're going to be kind of like allies. See, we're going to ride till the, the Negro till he come around. Everybody else shoots the niggas they to kill them niggas. Not us. We going to ride boss man till he crack. Boss man is ready to crack. All we got to do now, we ready to convince the Negro that it's all right. It's historically you can trust the Negro. That's right. That's where we are right today. We're very close. Yeah, we're very close to uh, flipping the whole thing. And when we flip the Negro, it's all over for boss man. It's all over for boss man. They just have to few, see a few more examples. Example, boss man, look, boss man and went, went crazy. But when the Negro looking at him, he don't look crazy. He's not paying attention. But everything historically that boss man is doing right now, this boy have not won a fight. And it's almost unfair that we got a whoop boss man. Boss man haven't won a fight since the 50s. Not Korea. Mm -mm. Ceasefire, right? We don't even want to talk about Vietnam. He did go down and Grab Noriega in 1990, put him in jail. The, the, all, all that dope that Noriega sold for him, and then he go put him in jail. That's terrible. See, I used to live in Panama. Not that I was doing nothing wrong down there, but they got Bank of America down there in Panama, and they got so a lot of people. In, and Colombia is right over there. You throw a rock at Colombia. Why? Because the United States stole the Panama Canal. From Colombia. And it's a line that's big enough. Panama is wide enough to 
for ships to go by, right? That's all they wanted. And a few people that live along the, you know, the canal. Right? That's Panama. Right where, it, where they wanted to put it. So you have to have patience enough. A sabru wa nifsuli man. Patience is half of faith. A sabru jamilan. Beautiful patience. Okay. Right now we're in a we're in a state right now. Whether you believe it or not, I'm just telling you. Whether you like it or not, that's not uh, our job. We're just telling you where the world is now. We're telling you where we're going to try to go. Right? We're going to try to get there at all costs. It don't make no difference because after all, you get to be 100 years old, what are you going to do? Try to be here forever? Well, 176 is almost 100. For niggas, 76 years old from the game we used to be in, the life expectancy is 22, 21, 19, right? What about the young blacks, all the brothers right around here in D.C.? During the, eight, during the 90s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you saw rest in peace all over the southeast, right? They wiped each, each other out. All You don't hear much about that gang activity. Not like it was. They knocked each other off. They finished it. We don't do that. Mm-mm. So, this is called strategic brilliance. Now, I just tell you, I have to tell you, boss man, you get a free ride because he don't think you, you're qualified to go up against him. That's, that's your free ride. You know, you can play the old coon, you can play, oh, boss man, I, I'm just playing with you. you. I'm just talking down at the mouth, gee, you know you the boss man. And the first go around, he said, yeah, so you, 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 you know I'm the chief. Yes, sir, but good God Almighty. Mm-hmm. Show sure enough. Mm-hmm. Anything? Uh, and then you punch him. Pow, pow, pow. His eyes get swollen up. Nigga, we're going to finish you all, boss man. I was just playing. You wouldn't hurt old Musa. Tell the truth. You wouldn't get, how you think I get this old? I just got lucky? Tell the truth. Some of you think that. That nigga got lucky. Everybody else come up with him as dead, but he got lucky. Yeah, well, where's your luck? How many zillions of dollars do you have? If I got lucky, you ought to be able to get lucky too, right? No, it's systematic. <laughs> The boss man mess around and allow you enough time to study him, his history, and to plan and actualize your own future, writing your own book. We talk about it all the time. And he get close to you, so what? Oh, boss man, I think he's about tired of that. You know where we learned that old boss man thing? In California, when I was up at McNeil Island, that's a federal prison. Now, in California, we didn't talk to police like that. You know, police is police. But they had a lot of Southern Negroes, since it's a federal prison, from down this way and deep south. And we watched them Negroes. They was crookeder than we was, but they could get anything they wanted from the dumb federal police who was all ex-soldiers. Oh, boss man, that's what they call, that's why we call him boss man. Negroes in California, this cracker, this peck of wood, da, 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 da. And I watched them old Southern Negroes. They got everything they wanted. Boss man, now the dumb police, once you call him boss man, you know who I am. Therefore, what do you want to take? You want to uh, sell 200 sandwiches a night 
roast beef sandwiches, right? Sure, go on in the kitchen and make them up. And I'll just want two or three, me and the boys, right? And you can see the Negroes, the Southern Negroes, walking down the tier, roast beef, roast beef sandwiches in the penitentiary, right? Why? They just rub old boss man, all oh, boss man. We don't give you something too. And then the old kitchen boss, he the same way. All you got to do, just let him know you not no threat. Oh, boss man, uh, man, we're going to need some, what's it, what you, you order and make an order? Well, would you order some extra beans and stuff? What you need extra beans for, Johnny? Well, boss man, we was thinking about making some bean pies. You know, in the penitentiary, you could get wonderful bean pies, tell the truth. Made by Negroes. They don't cost much, but they sure taste good. So you hook that up, right? With revolution, why waste your time bumping your head, oh, boss man? That's strategic brilliance. I'm just telling you what it is so you understand. So when you look at what's going on, you won't say, boy, that is a dumb nigga taking all that from them white. No, they're taking nothing from no boss. Boss man is the one that's finished, right? I'm going to close with this thing. Show me something boss man and done right in the last decades. And the closer it get to the day, right? His French friends, he just double-crossed them the day before. <clears throat> Day before that, it was the Afghanis. Right? He just double crossed them and going to try to double cross them like he did before, but it don't work this time because it's 20 years different. Right? Boss man is through. The only problem is, is convincing the community that uh, uh, the victory is at hand. The victory is here. One thing you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about boss man. You take all your money and you try to get gold with it or something because this guy here is getting ready to go broke. Why? Historically, it happened to everybody. <laughs> right? It happened to the Romans. Right? It happened to the Greeks. It happened to the British. It happened to the most well-organized <clears throat> societies in history. That's a chronic historical dispensation. Study those before you, right? That you learn hikmah. That's what it is. Just paying attention. Let me move on. So I just close by saying, Domestication is possible. You've seen it. Oh, but they took you this, they took you that. That ain't nothing. We're still here. When you go on a war, you want to fight the biggest monster in world history. You don't want to lose nothing. Right? This is going to have a super victory. We're going to, going to get nothing. Right? But... Whatever you give up, you set it out there for him to snatch. I'll snatch this from you, nigga. I'll snatch that. That'll show you. Then he snatch it. Well, I'll bust you upside the head and make you fight other niggas. Mm -hmm. You have blood streaming down. <laughs> All of that. So, no, I ain't fighting no niggas. Are you, you scared of niggas? That's what they, you scared of niggas. Scared of them? Yeah, is that so? Uh, well, we'll see. One thing we do know is that if you want to end the war against the white man, start fighting niggas. Indians start fighting Indians. War's over. Boss man won, right? He ain't winning this time. And I'm going to tell you, boss man is hurting because the Negro's ability, strategic brilliance, Strategic imagination. All these historical traps delay timing. 
system domestication. You domesticate the system. The system domesticates you. He send you to prison, he do all of that, right? So what if you domesticate the system? You can do it. Yeah, that's happening. That's happening. That's where we're coming from. That's what we're doing. Uh, I'll move toward a close, though. See, we got boss man. You got a, we got boss man in a in a tractor beam. Y'all watch Star Trek? They got a tractor beam, stuff like that. We got the white man in a tractor beam. He can't go nowhere. And you say you ain't doing that, nigga? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Because there comes periods in history where those that was overlooked, right, are actually in the driver's seat. And that's where we are. And we told you 10, 15 years ago that when this period come, what did we say? Think about it. We're going to claim the right of that. We're going to say that we did that. Not it just happened. Does anybody remember that? We say we going to do this to the white man. Now, either we just fortune tellers with cards or we really did it. Right? Everything that's happening today, we said that's going to happen to boss man and we taking the credit. Not that Allah got all the credit. Don't worry. When we say me, 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 ah, uh, that's a bunch of jive. It's all a lie. Uh, don't ever forget that. But to make the white man mad, we just say, yeah, I did this, white man. We did this. Me, I did this. That makes him super mad. And that's part of the thing is to make him mad. Start swinging wild. Is he swinging wild? No, of course he is. He have not hit nothing. In decades, boss man is missing. Boss man is slipping up. And I'm going to move toward a close. But remember, we are not. Boss man is the Yamamoto, not us. Boss man is the Bismarck, not us. He's out of time. And remember those big ships? They spent millions it would be billions now on those big ships in World War II. And America and the British came along with torpedoes with $500. <laughs> they sunk billions to the deep blue sea, right? That's what we're doing. We're just here hanging out. There's a few people here, right? And we slapping boss man to death. You think he ain't, he not mad? He mad. And he tried to trap, retrap, or send some Zionists to get us. We said, that ain't no bad thing. No sweetie pie Zion. You don't matter scared of them. Right? You look in the paper. He says, stop playing around, stupid. <sighs> to make us think or to, you know, <laughs> look. And when you can peek his whole card, he's a sad cracker. Yes, he is a sad cracker. And I'm going to close with this, but one of the things the Negro is specialized in, even under oppression, is making fun of white folks, right? Tell the truth. Making fun of boss man, that's been one of our biggest helps. Under all this oppression, you just have to laugh at it, man, because it's so, right, it's so destructive, it'll break you into little pieces. So you have to have a special ability to laugh at it. But now we're using it big time. Yeah, boss man, and here's the Negro. He's just going to slap you upside the head. And guess what happens? Here come the news. The people of Afghanistan was doing this, and Da, 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 I was doing that. And the Iranians, and I'm going to leave you with this. Hey, we have to help in our own way, and it's coming soon. The people of Syria, they didn't destroy it, right? We got to get the world to help rebuild it. People of Yemen, right? 
that they blockaded and cut off, we have to encourage the world to run those blockades. Yeah, blockade runners. And feed the people with med- and have medicine. That's what we have to do because boss man ain't giving up nothing, right? And Iran, Iran and survived over 40 years. And that first 10 years was serious. We was there with them every step of the way. I'm telling you, that's one of the greatest epics in history. For them to stand up against the whole world with no help. Now they're getting on. <laughs> they got the world moving toward them. They got Soviet Union helping them a little, but Russia, whatever they call it. The Chinese helping them a little. We say helping a little. Don't worry about China. Don't worry about Russia. We understand them. We have to try to help them be of a bigger help than they already are. And we can help them pass out their racism and get rid of them. So China will leave Africa in the great future. It's just speculation, of course. And leave Africa to Africans. And not be selling all them Chinese noodles in Africa. Because Africans eat ugali and other stuff. They don't eat all that stuff, right? Start giving them heart trouble, liver trouble, digestive trouble. The Chinese is over there cooking the food that they eat, the crackers and potato, white folks' potato chips in Africa. And the Africans is used to eating African food, Right? So we, right here, the Negro, going to help everybody. Yes, we are, I'm telling you. That's what we headed toward. We're going to help everybody. That's why we was taking all them trips around the world. Okay. The last thing, the USS Titanic. Then already hit the iceberg, finished. It hasn't it happens went under yet. But it's then hit that iceberg, the USS Titanic. Boy, look at here. And he hit it in the right way. If they'd have kept going and hit that iceberg straight on, they'd have been all right. Because they had all, they could close off everything. But they didn't do that. They tried to miss it. And when they tried to miss it, it cut us all the way down the side. Isn't that right? That's why it went down so fast. I'm telling you. So, the historical Titanic then hit the iceberg. It could have been Rome, Britain, USA, Greece, Egypt. History got them all. Isn't that right? And now we're here. This is a pleasure for us to be here. We are not oppressed. We are here to help the world understand Truth from falsehood. That's why we're here. It don't make no difference to two or three of us. Don't worry about it. Also, we figure out that's our mission. We have to have strategic brilliance in order to even think about doing it because nobody else wants it, right? That's why <laughs> we're accepting a job nobody wants. Darn it, you don't want it, Right? Mellow Yellow and them don't want it. None of the other movements want it. Nobody wants this. Right? That's why it's so valuable. Because nobody want it. Well, Lord, we seek that refuge from anxiety and grief. We seek that refuge from lack of strength and laziness. We seek that refuge from cowardice and niggardliness. And we seek that refuge from being overpowered by debt and the oppression of men. Well, Allah suffices with what is lawful. Keep from us what is prohibited. With thy grace, make us free from what of what is beside thee. I mean, he commented this a lot.